Hey everyone, this is Jeff Risen. About to do a solo show for the Detroit Lions podcast. Chris and I can get together. So uh, relax, sit back, grab a cup of your favorite beverage, and uh, let's do this. You're right. We got uh, we got a lot to talk about since uh, the last we've spoken. Uh, there's some things that have happened. Let's start with the uh, the awkward one. Let's get it out of the way. Cam Sutton. Cam Sutton is no longer a member of the Detroit Lions, and that makes me happy. Unfortunately, the reason why he's not a member of the Detroit Lions anymore makes me very unhappy. And look. If you're watching this, you know what you know what's you know what's up. Uh, I'm recording this Sunday morning. It's about eleven o'clock on Sunday morning. As of now, Cam Sutton is still at large. He is while well, the the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Department in uh, Florida, the Tampa area, won't we'll call him a fugitive. He's effectively a fugitive. There is an arrest warrant out for him. He still has not been found uh, for a domestic violence. By strangulation, and if you've heard some of the accounts that are out there, don't know if they're true or not. If they're even close to being true, real bad, real bad. And while I hope that he's okay, I hope that he has not like physically harmed himself. I hope that he's fine and is found and is safe. Uh, he needs to be punished for what he did. If if the allegations that are out there are true and the lions would not probably do much about this if they didn't have some pretty convincing evidence that it was true. Um, and it's frustrating. It's annoying. A domestic violence is a zero tolerance thing for me. I, I was very mad when I heard the rather specific accusation that's out there against him. Uh, and again, I don't, I don't know if it's true. I'm, I'm not an investigative reporter. That's not what I do. I don't get paid nearly enough to do that kind of stuff. So I just tell you that uh, uh, if the allegations are even close to being true, I'm very glad that he's gone. Uh, this is a football show, so we're going to talk about the football side of it. He does leave a hole. Insert your stickers here. I get it. Look, he didn't play well at the end of last year, and that's <laughs> that's indisputable. But he was being counted on to be the number two or number three outside corner, depending on your opinion of Amik Robertson. Robertson, easy for me to say. I happen to think that Amik is probably a better man corner, and Cam Sutton was better in the zone realm. And we were going to see which way Aaron Glenn wanted the defense to go before we could really ascertain which one of those guys would be starting or playing more. Now, right now, before the draft, we are what, 33 days out, something like that, um, before the draft in Detroit. Now we are looking at a cornerback group that includes Carlton Davis and Amik Robertson on the outside, Brian Branch on the inside. So we're, we're great there. You feel really good about Carlton Davis. I like Amik Robertson competing to start. Um, and if he wins it, that's fantastic. I'm bullish on him. I know, I know he's short, but he's not small. Uh, doesn't play small. Uh, I I I'm I like him. If you watched the show last week, you you know that I'm an advocate for Amik Robertson. But he needs competition, and he needs better competition than Khalil Dorsey, or I don't even know who else is on the roster at the moment. <laughs> like they need a cornerback, an outside cornerback specifically. Whether that's a first round pick, whether it's uh, Kool Aid McKinstry, who's who was the the choice in the latest mock draft. Uh, that I did it for Lions Wire. You can check that out there. Thank you. Uh, whether it's Ennis Rakestraw, who I don't think is going in the first round, that's, and I think he's going to be gone before the second round pick, which is a little bit of an awkward situation. Maybe, maybe you move back, maybe you move up. I don't know. Uh, but uh, you need competition in there. It's the long and the short of it. And the cornerback group that's still out there, look, a lot of people are like, crying for Stefan Gilmore and we're, we're going to get to the luxurious Steve thing in a second that that's that's next on the list look Stephen Gilmore um the the revisiting the trade for Greg Newsom um which which I had talked about uh 
got a while ago. Um, my understanding is that the Browns are not looking to trade Greg Newsom as voraciously as they were earlier, but would still part with him if the the offer was there. I don't think the Lions have any interest in doing that uh, at this point. Um, that's that's my read on it from the Cleveland side of things. Um, I have not been able to talk to anybody about that on the Detroit side. So, you know, and I, I don't think it's happening, long and short of it. Stephen Gilmore, great. Like, his brother's on the team. That's cool. He's looking at a guy that's kind of bounced around and, you know, might not have a lot left. Um, I would prefer that they get somebody a little bit younger that you can be a building block for when, you know, Amik Robertson on a two-year deal is gone. Or, you know, the depth. They need, they need bodies, period. Um, you know, Chase Lucas is gone. Jerry Jacobs is gone. Jerry's not coming back. Uh, that's, you know, they're, they are in need of talent. And if it's a one year stopgap, that's great, but they're clearly not interested in filling that role in free agency with any of the guys that are out there. Otherwise they would be in Detroit already. Now, some of that is that the players themselves, we are getting to the point in free agency where players are like, no, nah, man, I'm gonna wait till after the draft and see where I can land because this team like they might need me now, but what if they draft two guys in my position? Then, then what? I'm stuck. I'm fighting for my job with a rookie that I, you know, no, players don't want that. More to the point, agents really don't want that for their players because then it looks, then it looks bad on the agent. Like, you put me here? What are you doing? You know, that, yeah. So I don't think you're going to see a lot of significance in any free agency for most teams. Uh, any of the guys that are left are, we're getting very close to the point where they're just going to be like, no, I'm just, I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait till after the draft and then pick my spot. That's what I would do if I was a player. That's probably what you would do if you were a player, unless you were really desperate to get that check and security, which I, I, I can see that. I, I buy that angle, but most players are not in that door right now. So especially for a veteran like Gilmore, um, and I'm just bringing him up as an example. Why would you... Why would you lock yourself into a place now when they might use a first and a fourth round draft pick on your position? Like that doesn't make any sense if you're a player, right? So the big fish was Legeria Sneed. Let's talk about him for a little bit. Um, you know what? Rewind. Scratch back. Got to talk about the money involved with the with uh, Cam Sutton. The Lions will get the money back, the cap room and everything back, but he's been designated a June 1st cut, which means that they can't use any of it before June 1st because he's still technically on the team until that point. His transaction does not get processed until June 1st. So as much as they said that we've released him, technically not yet. <laughs> like they, they they've let him know that he's going to be gone. Well, he can't be reached. So they don't. He does probably doesn't even know. Maybe I don't know. I don't. I don't know. But in order to get the cap relief on the avoided part of the contract, the, the behavior that's been described in fleeing from police, not being able to be found, that certainly will avoid the uh, the guarantee clauses in his contract. But. That doesn't happen now. The, the The court case has to be adjudicated. There has to be some closure to it in the legal system before the NFL will take that back. The Lions can sue him. They probably are going to sue him for, to recoup some of the signing bonus as well. Again, that's great that they can say that they can do that now, but that doesn't mean anything changes now. He is still counting that much against the cap until until that legal process plays out, until he's found, until he's tried, until we know more about what, what exactly the charges are about. Uh, so it, it's nice to get excited about it, and we're going to get that cap relief, and it's going to be very useful. But none of that's available until after June 1st, until well after the draft. So you just kind of have to table that, um, that, that that money will be available. It will be. It'll be great when it's there. Uh, and hopefully it will be used to replace him in some capacity. But right now... Right now, it's not there, um, and you can't treat it like it's there. There's been a lot of people that have you know, speculated, oh, because the Lions have, have filed 
that they want to avoid it. Well, yeah, that's great Th- that they need to do that. That's that's just procedural. It doesn't mean that it's happened yet. Um, they can't even that the NFL won't even look at processing that until after June first when his transaction is processed. So there's a lot of loopholes. There's a lot of um, paperwork that they have to go through to to get these things done, and uh, it just it just doesn't move that quickly. Um, that's just the way it is. Um, you know, uh, for uh, to, to, to one, remember the Aaron Hernandez case? Yeah, the Patriots didn't get that money back for three full seasons. That's how long it took them to process that. I don't think that's going to be the case with Cam Sutton. He didn't kill anybody, hopefully. But yeah, the, so there, there's some time on that. All right. Back forward. Back forward. Yeah, sorry. Long weekend. <laughs> More coffee needed. Yeah. Legerius Sneed. A lot of us wanted him to be in Detroit. A lot of us wanted to trade for him. I'm one of them. Based on what the Tennessee Titans did to acquire him, the Detroit Lions were never, never going to be in the conversation to make that acquisition. It's a third round pick in 2025 and sixth round, uh, seventh round pick swap this year. Okay, that price is nothing. There's a reason why Kansas City got nothing in effect for him. They can't pay him. And Tennessee has agreed to a, a four year, uh, was it $78 million contract? 76, 76. 19 million a year. 55 million guaranteed. That's like 70% guaranteed. Ain't no way the Lions are doing that. Just look at the people that they've signed. Look at how Brad Holmes has done business. Look at how Mike Disner has ha- helped handle the cap. Look at the moves that have happened under this regime with those two and Chris Spielman and John Dorsey running the show. They don't do that. They don't give their own players that kind of money for that kind of time. One of the reasons why this team is so flexible right now is because they don't have bad contracts on the book. They haven't done the Trey Flowers deal. They haven't done the Halapula Vadi Vitae deal. That they're, those are gone. Like this team isn't signing somebody to a five-year, one hundred and ten million dollar contract, even even if it makes them the best player on the team. That's just not what they're doing, unless they really trust in it. I'm on Ross St. Brown. Think for a second if you're Amon Ra, you're looking for an extension. Everybody knows you're looking for an extension. And the Lions go out and instead sign a cornerback who's got chronic knee problems. Talk about that in a second. And you're going to give him all that money for to reward him for what he did for the Chiefs. And hope that he fits in your locker room, in your scheme, in your in your secondary, you know, with the the culture that's in there. Like, I think Legereus Steed would, but there's some risk there. And the knee issue, this is one that I don't think gets played up enough in Detroit. And it's interesting because if you're reading Chiefs stuff, like, they're all about like, yeah, we got rid of, like, thank God his knee lasted as long as it did. Like, we had to get rid of this. Uh, Tennessee is stupid as hell for doing this. Like, do they not know? Do they not know that he can't practice uh, more than once a week? Do they not know that he could, didn't play in the preseason at all last year? Do they not know that we're walking on eggshells with him all the time with his knee? That's obviously what we're playing, but that's what, look, when you lose a player as an or- as a fan base and an organization and media, you like, you want to soften the blow. So, that, there's some of that going on. There's no doubt about it. But there's there's legit concern to be worried about his knee. And I don't think, well, we're going to make jokes about Brad Holmes, like, you know, being all excited that, you know, um, a prospect has had, you know, two knee surgeries and, and you know, two separated shoulders. Um, hi, Michael Penix Jr. Hi, Peyton Wilson. Uh, that, you know, that's. You don't want to be that flippant with that kind of money, and that, look, that can be. But look, you can, you can. The Lions can afford it. Technically, right now, Luxurious Need because the, the contract hasn't been processed yet is still counting nineteen point seven eight million dollars. This franchise tag value for a cornerback against Tennessee's cap. 
That would have happened in Detroit, too. That takes Detroit's cap down to, right now, would be around $8.5 million. That's a little bit lower than what the cushion that the bread... Now, obviously, when you sign the new contract, you, the Lions would... That four-year deal that he agreed to is four years, $76 million, would have two or three void years on it. So, they would spread that out, you know, but you still got to pay it in time. And that's just not what the Lions are going to do. So, yes, it's frustrating that a very good quarterback who's got a lot of talent, who I think would fit very well in our scheme, is going elsewhere because the Lions aren't willing to make that, but they're not willing to take that risk. And the ancillary risks that are with that, um, you know, okay, if we sign him and we've got Carlton Davis in and we just brought Amik Robertson in, that means that our draft options at cornerback are kind of closed, at least early on. Like, we're going to not, we're not. If they have that commitment, like, why would you bring somebody in who you don't expect to play for two to three years? Like, that doesn't make any sense. Um, the players wouldn't like that. Yeah, you, unless you're taking them, like, sixth or seventh round, they're going to be a stud on special teams, like like Chase Lucas allegedly was, um, like Jerry Jacobs was hoped to be. You know, that's just – you're not taking a first or a second round pick when you've got that level of commitment and money – at those positions tied up already. You just you can't do that. That's not that's what bad football teams do. And the Lions are not a bad football team any longer, thank God. So that would have boxed them in a little bit, taken away some of their options. That's not what Brad does. It's just not. So I hear the fans, I hear you when you say I would have done that deal in a heartbeat and gotten the upgrade that we need. And locked in Legeria C to have our, our secondary locked down for as long, you know, two, three seasons. We're good. Like, I get that. I, I feel that. <laughs> Trust me, I feel it. But that's not what this, this that's not what this team is. And, you know, the, the concept of radical acceptance has to kick in sometimes. Like, you got, you just have to, that's not what we are. Not what we are anymore. So, and by the way, that way didn't work. Let's just see if, if you're going to trust in Brad the way that, you know, has become the, the cult saying, you actually have to do it. Like, you can't just say it. You like, you have to mean it. You have to feel it. If you don't feel it, then don't say it. Like, just be good. Like, be good with the concept that is, they believe they have made the right choice for the, the future of this team. They have earned that benefit of the doubt from me. Hopefully they have from you too. Uh, and hopefully that it will continue to play that way. I'm pretty bullish that it will. I like this cornerback class. I like the guys that are there in the first, the second, the third round. There are still guys that they can get that will be very good. Will they, will they be luxurious need? Probably not in 2024. But 2025, with another year of wear and tear on Steve's knee, $19 million salary, a lot of guaranteed bonus going in, signing bonus, amortization, sucking your cap away. Like, yeah, maybe maybe a guy like Jarvis Brownlee or uh, I don't know, Ennis Rakestraw in the second, maybe. Like there's there's possibilities for these guys to to step up and 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 be be close to the value that you would get. Um and it also keeps your options open for free agency if by chance Carl Davis doesn't work out, Amik Robertson doesn't work out. You know, you, you they're set up for the future. And I, I kind of like having the options. That's one of the things that Brad Holmes has taught me. As a longtime observer of the team, longtime credential media media of the team, is that I I need to rethink the concept of locking in long term. This is something Chris and I have talked about this a lot. Look, players don't want those long term contracts anymore. They realize that they were serving the agent more than they were serving the player. Thank you, Kirk Cousins, man. God bless him. He he figured that out, and it, it's going around the league. Look at most of the free agent deals that are going on this year. Four years max. A lot of them are three. Some of them are two. Some of them are two with two void years. But the the mega contracts, by and large, aren't happening anymore. That that means that you know Brad Holmes, they're a little bit ahead of the curve on this. Um, and I like that. I like the fact that the players are not locking themselves in to situations that might change or might not work for them. I think that that's a level of increased awareness on the players' part that I, I greatly appreciate. 
Uh, and I, you know, I, I'm, I'm with the Lions on that, but he would have looked good, man. He would have. I know. It is what it is, but, uh, you know, we're, uh, we are a good football team now, and we are good because our front office and regime and mindset has steered us in this direction. Uh, I don't want them to break character on that. I want them to continue doing what's working. So even though it might disappoint me a little bit, maybe a little bit more than a little bit, uh, I'm okay with it because I, th- I trust in the end result, and I'm seeing the end result, and I believe in it. So uh, we're good with that. And now it's time for Draft Talk. <laughs> yeah. NFL Draft coming up quick. Downtown Detroit. Registration's open. Make sure you're registered for it. It's free, but you do need you do need to, to register via the NFL. Details are easily to find out there. But uh, do it. It's, look, it's probably a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. It probably won't be coming back to Detroit. They're kind of rotating it around a lot. So if you can get there, go. It's fun. I went to both, both, both the drafts in Chicago. I went to the one in Cleveland. I have been to Radio City Music Hall twice, uh, including the last one that was there. It's a lot of fun to go. It's great. It's an experience. If you got kids, take them down. There's there's cool things for the kids to do too. Uh, but you do have to register. Um, I feel compelled to know that. And um, look, if you're trying to get like the primo tickets. Just keep in mind, the Detroit Lions, they don't have anything to do with this draft. This is an NFL event. It is not a Lions event. It just happens to be in Detroit. The Lions have their own thing going on. I would suggest you check that out because uh, they've done a pretty good job with uh, with handling draft events in the past. So uh, don't don't confuse that. Like, Don't blame the Lions if you can't get into the draft. Like, uh, different, different things. Um, but it's going to be cool. So I thought, because we haven't really talked about it much here, uh, that I would go over the five players, five, that I am most interested in the Lions getting at number 29 overall. Now, there are a couple stipulations here. Number one is that they actually stay at number 29. I don't actually think they're going to be picking at number 29. I think they're trading out of the first round and into the second round and picking up an extra pick, uh, maybe a pick for next year as well. Uh, because the difference between the player you can get at 29 and the d- player you can get at 38 might be able to get the same guy. Uh, and I think Brad Holmes is right enough to know that and, and acquire more assets. Um, I know there's a lot of people that are interested in trading up. That third round pick that they traded for Carlton Davis, that was their leverage to trade this year. Um, now, if you're trading up, you're looking at dealing next year's pick. So let's say you want to move from 29 to 20 to get Jackson Powers Johnson, which, oh my God, would be great. I'll talk about that in a second. So you're giving up 29 and your second round pick this year, and you probably would have needed your third round pick there too. But you don't want to give that up now. So you'd be giving up 29 and your second round pick. Actually, probably your third round pick this year. Uh, you keep your second, but then you're dealing your first next year. I don't know if Brad Holmes will do that. I don't know if this Lions team wants to do that. I don't know if I want them to do that, quite frankly, for any one player. So I I get the if you held if you held my feet to the fire, I would say that they are not trading up, that the trade back is much, 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 much more likely. We'll see. But I really don't think they're moving up. I don't think there's anybody that they view as that integral and that realistic to get. Now, if now if it's, you know, so I have written down here my notes. Five guys that I would want most at number 29 but there's a list of four guys above it who supersede everything i don't think any of these four players would be there but if they were they are instantly to the top of the list and they do fall in this exact order for lions purposes only there are other teams that you know i i frankly wouldn't draft one of these guys for another team if they're in a different scheme but jackson powers johnson quinion mitchell terry ann arnold and graham barton if any of those are there at 29 Everything else I'm about to say, 
you can throw away, you can ignore, because I'm taking those guys without hesitation. And if any of these guys are still on the board at 25-ish, then I'm thinking about trading next year's first along with 29 to go get them. Again, I don't know if the Lions would do that. I would. Uh, so, again, Jackson Powers Johnson, Quinion Mitchell, Terry and Arnold, the cornerback from Alabama, who's really, really good, folks, uh, and Graham Barton, who can play tackle or center, uh, and I would try to pigeonhole him in a little bit as a guard, too, but um, we'll see on that. Um, but uh, th th those are my four that I would take over any of these guys. So the five guys that I personally – think are the best fits at number 29 of players that are realistically expected to be there. Like, and I, I listed those guys earlier. I don't think any of them are going to last even the 25. We'll see. Um, I'm not, look, I'm not looking at, you know, like, uh, t um, the Pat Dallas Turner will not be there. He'd be great. I'd love him. Freaking love him. <laughs> he's not included in this list because he's not going to be there. Uh, that's just the way it is. Marvin Harrison Jr., Malik Neighbors, Romo Dunsey, like they're not going to be there. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not even going to fantasize about it. Like I, out of, out of mind. Um, these are not in order, by the way. These are just the way that I wrote them down. So maybe, maybe subconsciously they're in order. I don't know. I really don't want to. I don't want to go down that path of having anybody in my head, uh, especially myself. Um, Darius Robinson, edge, defensive end. Calling him an edge is a little disingenuous because you don't ever want him standing up. Edge, Missouri. Think Ziggy Ansa, but bigger. That's the kind of player that he is. He is not a guy who's going to win with speed off the edge. He's going to win with length and power and power to speed. Sounds like Aiden Hutchinson. Hutch has, Hutch has really short arms for his length, but he's long, like he's tall. And uh, he, know, he knows how to use the arms well. Um, Robinson, he does, he does actually remind me still of Ziggy. He reminds me also some physically of Cam Jordan the, uh, from the Saints. Now, he is not nearly as an explosive of an athlete or as twitchy or as laterally agile as Cam Jordan. Don't be fooled by that comparison. But, like, if you just look at them physically, they look similar in, the, in terms of their build that way. They don't operate the same way, but that, that's, that's the sort of thing. Um, his game is not dissimilar to what Montez Sweat does for, for Washington and now Chicago. A power-based... Um, use my length, use my strength to get the edge on the tackle, to set the edge, rush the passer. Um, he's not a guy ever going to be a guy who's going to blow around the edge unless it's, you know, I guess a really bad player. Matt Nelson. See ya. Enjoy the Giants. Good luck with that, New York. Thank you. Had to throw that in there. Um, but he, he's a very good football player, and I can see the appeal to the Lions for him and how he would fit in there. Uh, so I, I, Darius Robinson is one next name on the list that I wrote down is Zach Frazier center. You can play guard to West Virginia. He is technically sound. He's very adept. He's good at firing off the ball. He can, he can pull or slide one gap over if you need him to as either guard or center. He's got that sort of lateral quickness. He can make those things happen. Look, the starting lineup is effectively set. He comes in, and he is your top reserve interior lineman. Guess what? That guy plays a lot in Detroit, whether it's injuries to Frank Ragnow, Jonah Jackson. God bless you, buddy. You're, you're gone. Um, you know, Halapu Avati Vaitai was, was supposed to be the starting right guard last year. He's gone. Kevin Zeidler, 34 years old. He's been incredibly durable. By the way, didn't, didn't talk about that earlier. I freaking love that signing. I covered him in Cleveland. I like Zeitler a lot. He is boring as hell, and that's a great thing to be if you're an offensive guard. You don't want your guards to be, like, prominent. <laughs> like, like, I know who that guy is. I watch him all the time. I'm like, Kevin Zeidler is very good wallpaper. 
pretty good run blocker, not the best. Um, and I, I would say that Jonah Jackson was a better run blocker, but pass protection, me and you are getting Kevin Zeitler in snap consistency in every play. I'm, I covered him in Cleveland in 2017 and 2018 when he was the highest paid guard in the NFL. And while he didn't probably live up to that billing, um, he was really good. And one of the things that you noticed then was the like, he was good on play one, he was good on play 30, he was good on play 70. Like the same dude all the time, every game. Went back and watched some of his Ravens highlights last year. He's an age, man. It's crazy. He's lost like a little bit. He's still really good. Um, but he's one year situation. Frank Rag now. We don't know how much longer he has. So it, it makes a lot of sense to get a guy in here who can who can be groomed and trained into that role. Uh, and also be the top reserve. So Zach Frazier does that. By the way, when you watch Zach Frazier at West Virginia, you kind of get that Kevin Zeitler vibe. He's not a guy who overwhelms you. He's not a guy that has like highlight pancakes. He's got a couple. He just like he just gets the job done all the time. Very technically sound, athletic enough. Uh, he's he's a good player, real good player, uh, and I would be very happy to get him at twenty nine. I don't know if the Lions are all that interested in him. We know. <laughs> Pretty good idea that the Lions like Darius Robinson a lot. Does that mean they're going to take him? I don't know. I can tell you I know that they like him a lot. Zach Frazier, I don't know where the Lions are at on him. Haven't haven't heard. I haven't have really asked, to be honest. So that, that one's a bit of a mystery. But uh, he, he would be perfectly acceptable for me there. Next name on the list. I try to pick one from each position of relative need here. Next name I wrote down is South Carolina wide receiver Xavier Leggett. We interviewed him, Chris and I did, at the Senior Bowl. Check it out. Look up in the Detroit Lions podcast archives. Um, it's on there. Uh, by the way, if you like and subscribe, you will know when we're coming at you with these things, and uh, I get to jump into your ear holes automatically, and uh, you, you, you would have seen it already. Uh, but if you haven't, check it out. It's cool. He's a low-key guy. We interviewed him first thing in the morning. Um, it was like... Set, it was like 7.15 a.m. Uh, and he had a very long day out of him. So he wasn't like, he wasn't dialed up enthusiasm-wise, but uh, it, you, you, you can get the, you can, you can, it conveys pretty well that he's the type of guy that the Lions like. Big receiver, wide catch radius, very good at working over the middle, yards after the catch. He's a bull to bring down. He is not easy to tackle in the open field. He's not easy to tackle on a quick slant. He's a guy that if it's third and seven and he's tasked with running a comeback route, he's not going to come back to six yards out. He's going to come back to seven, where when he catches that ball, the first down is there. That's something that I don't think the Lions have had an appreciation for as much as I would like them to. Uh, his attention to detail is very good. He is an enthusiastic, albeit erratic, blocker down the field. I like him. I think he'd be a good fit. He is, of, of all the guys that I listed here, he is the one that is most likely to fall deeper into the second round. Um, Darius Robinson, I don't even know if he's going to be there at 29. Uh, I know there are a couple of other teams that are picking above them, above the Lions that really like him, the Eagles being one of them. Um, funny how we have the, the same sort of, of taste as the Eagles in, in a lot of things. Uh, I don't know why they would take him. They have the first round pick last year, Nolan Smith, who can't get on the field. Uh, and they went on side Bryce Huff. Um, I, their, their depth chart is just ridiculous. They still have Hassan Reddick on the team. Like, I, I don't know what they're doing, but uh, the, all sources indicate that they seem to really like him. So I guess the fact that they keep drafting good players and we seem to like the same players that they do, good sign, good validation for, for Holmes and company. Uh, but I like I like I like Darius I like Xavier Leggett a lot, uh, and I do think that he's a guy that if you trade back from twenty nine, um, let's say let's say Washington wants to come up with their two second round picks. I believe they're thirty four and forty. Like, would you take thirty four and forty for twenty nine, knowing that you get Xavier Leggett and Zach Frazier? I would sign me up, please, please. please. Just throwing out there that. Uh, you know, a lot of connections between Washington's front office and the Lions. Um, don't 
Don't think that might not mean something <laughs> next month in April when, when this is happening. Uh, again, I'm recording this on, on Sunday, uh, what is it, the 24th uh, of March. Uh, so we're a little over a month out. Uh, and uh, you know, we're still picking 29. These are still the players that I uh, were in the middle of the five that I would want at 29 the most. Um, doesn't necessarily mean that the Lions want them the most. These are my choices. Uh, and we've gotten to Darius Robinson, Zach Frazier, Xavier Leggett. Next on the list, <laughs> Clifford Dejean, defensive back, Iowa. He's a defensive back and needs to be called that in the same way that Brian Branch is called a defensive back because he can play, he can play outside corner. He can play slot nickel. He can play free safety. He can even play a little box safety if you want him to. He can also, by the way, be your punt returner if you need him to be. He wears a lot of hats. I like most of the hats that he wears. I don't actually want him as my slot, and that's not a problem because Brian Branch is there. We're good with Brian Branch. Like, right? Like, we all agree that Brian Branch is good. Um, it's fun to not have any dissension on a pick like that. <laughs> he's, he's, we're, we're good with that. So... I, I like Cooper DeGene there. I like his versatility. I will say, um, and I say this about a lot of players who are where they're le the, the, the top card that you pull when you're talking about how good they are is their versatility. I worry inherently about those guys that they never find one spot where they're really good, that they're just kind of like, oh, well, it's like a B plus outside corner. He's a, a B minus free safety. I would rather have an A at either of those positions, and a guy who's kind of kind of good at both, I think Cooper DeGene, he might be the exception to that rule, along with Brian Branch, because uh, I think Branch would be, I think Branch would be, I don't want him at outside corner, but either safety spot, and uh, of course, in the in the slot where he's at is uh, is pretty good. So DeGene is another one. I I'm not sure he's going to make it to 29, uh, and uh, the Buffalo Bills at 28. Are a very popular uh, trade. Or I'm sorry, um, projection for where he lands in mock drafts, and you'll notice that most of those are coming out of Buffalo itself. The Bills have been one of the easier teams. As some, trust me, I've been doing my. I have been covering the drafts since the 2004 draft. This is my 21st year covering the draft. The Buffalo Bills, especially with the last two regimes they've had, have typically been one of the easiest teams to project. They don't hide what they're doing all that much. They don't care because they're Buffalo. Like, we're good. We're Buffalo. We're, we're doing what we're doing. I admire that, by the way. I don't, don't mean that to race at all. There's a whole lot of people that are connecting Cooper DeGene to Buffalo. We'll see. I don't know. They, they might, might find something else that they want a little bit better, but uh, he's certainly on my list. And then the last one is sort of my pie in the sky pick. I doubt that Johnny Newton from Illinois is there at 29, but if he is, man, I'm running that card up. I am. He reminds me so much of Gerald McCoy as a prospect coming out of, of you know, when he was back in, in the 2010 draft. Remember, Ndamukong Sue went second. Gerald McCoy out of Oklahoma went third. I see a whole lot of Gerald McCoy's game in Johnny Newton. Has, has I would say that his focus on stopping the run isn't as strong, but I think that that can be fostered. I think a little of that was was Illinois like just just go get the quarterback, just annoy the crap out of him, beat the hell out of the guy in front of you, and annoy him too. Johnny Newton's really good at that. He's so quick, explosive, dynamic, and go over either shoulder and win. So he would be one that would be great. Now there's one name. If you read Lions Wire, if you know me at all from, from X, formerly Twitter, you'll know that I freaking love Cooper Beebe, offensive lineman out of Kansas State. He might be my official draft crush this year. He is a top 10 overall talent on my board. My board does not translate to the NFL's boards. I don't think that the Lions view him that highly. I don't think anybody in the NFL views him as more than a maybe late, late first rounder. 29, Detroit. It, like, I would be physically incapable of wearing pants for some time if Cooper Beebe was the choice at number 29. But I don't think they need to use 29 to get him. Just from 
all the feedback I've gotten from going to pro days, from talking to agents, from talking to scout employed NFL scouts, from talking to employed NFL coaches, position coaches at pro days and around pro days and at the combine and at the senior bowl. I don't, I don't think he's going that high. I think he's going in the 60s, 50s. That second round pick, that's where I'm going with Cooper Beebe. Um, w- would I take him at 29? Yes, I would. But if I don't have to, all the better. So that that's why he's not on the list. Um, for those of you who would get asking, I know you would. So there you go. Um, just to recap, the five guys that I would most like at number 29 right now, um, with the exceptions that I knew at the beginning of the segment, Darius Robinson, Zach Frazier, Xavier Legat, Cooper DeGene, and Johnny Newton. And with that, we're going to call it a show today. Thanks so much for tuning in. Chris and I are working furiously to try to get together again soon. It won't be this week, and it won't be the following week. I will be on spring break with my family. Um, I might do a recording um, at some point from there if uh, I can't sleep or whatever. Um, Or just, I'd miss Lions people. Um, I will be working while I'm there, but won't won't be doing a live show with Chris. Um, I will have a mailbag later this week before I leave. Uh, So if you're in the podcast Patreon Slack, Smartest chat on the internet. Get in on it, Lions fans. Um, Chris will be able to process that, even though he's not able to be with me. Um, he handles all that. Uh, but get your questions in there in the general chat, the Lions chat section, and uh, I will do my best to take care of all those on either Thursday or Friday so you can watch them uh, before next weekend. With that, this is Jeff Risen and the Detroit Lions podcast signing out. Thanks for tuning in. <laughs>